attend uh, the Court of Presbyterian Church of Jackson, Mississippi, I assume still. Okay. And uh, he got his uh, master's in marriage and family therapy from RTS in Jackson and got his doctorate in clinical psychology at Rosemead. And uh, has family, how many kids you got? Three. Three kids. Three kids. And uh, we're just excited to have him. Of course, he is a graduate of the University of uh, but we're glad John here. Thanks for coming back, man. I'm looking forward to being with you. Now, John, talk to everyone. Thank you. How many of y'all were here last year? All right. How many were not? Okay. Good. Um, basically, um, we would not be having this meeting or maybe any of the meetings you've been having if it were not for the fall. Um, we are all specialists in fallenness. My wife says that to me. Um, but what we, what we try to do is to learn about what the fall has done to people, how we're screwed up, and how to help people get unscrewed up. And in a lot of senses, that's, that's what I devote my professional life to, is understanding what makes people fallen, and what makes people broken, and what makes people get better. And um, that's what I want to do with you uh, here uh, today and tomorrow is to talk about that. But I want to begin with the ending of the story. Um, this is like one of those movies where in the, as the movie opens up, you know, it's like the, 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 the building blows up or something like that and then it freeze frames and says, you know, 13 weeks earlier. You know, and the whole movie is going to be a build up to this final thing. Let me tell you what the end of our story is about. We have a God who loves us enough who, um, that despite the fact that we live in the midst of this fall, tells us how it's going to turn out. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. Those of you who know covenant theology know this is God's song of the covenant. He's been singing since Genesis. I'll be your God, you'll be my people, and I will dwell among you. He keeps promising it. And the loud voice from the throne says, It's happening. Behold, the dwelling place of God is among men, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, or pain anymore. The former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And for some reason, he has decided that he wants us to be a part of that process with him. Of making things new. Of redeeming the fallen. Redeeming the broken. Let's talk to him for a minute before we get started. We are given the unimaginable privilege of speaking to he who sits on the throne. And yet... He who sits on the throne is also he who walks among us, he who lives in our hearts, he who knows our pain, he who knows our brokenness, and he who loves us. We thank you that you are our, our father, our brother, our savior. Um, I ask that you would walk with us in these hours today and the hours tomorrow as I am with these people. Um, we have to work hard and ask hard questions and write on the blackboard and raise hands and work really hard to understand wisdom and truth and healing. It comes naturally to you. It is your, your, in your character. We ask that you would be among us and um, let your character become part of ours as we try to learn how to help your sheep heal and grow and hopefully heal and grow in ourselves. In the name of he who sits on the throne we pray. Amen. Thank you. That's the end of our story. Uh, we have a really good ending. In the meantime, we live amongst the fall. Um, and what I want to do with you and uh, the time we have is I want to give you, I want to equip you as much as I can to understand the way our hearts work. Um, 
If you remember from last year, I talked to you uh, a, a good bit, sort of an apologetic for the legitimacy of how one-on-one -on -one works, why it is a necessary part of ministry. We're going to review that some today. We talked, um, we, we, we led off with, a, with my big basic four food groups um, of how the character works, how the human heart works. We're going to talk about that again. Um, I don't think you can hear that enough. Um, it is the DNA of all of the way I think about things. It gives us a, a, uh, a set of categories for understanding the image of God. It gives us a set of categories for understanding how people struggle. It gives us a set of categories for understanding how we heal. So we're going to talk about all of that kind of in the first hour. Next hour, um, I'm going to apply that in depth to adolescent dynamics. Um, so today we're going to look um, theoretically, we're going to look at big core concepts. Uh, some of it will be review, uh, but it is a really important review because I want it drilled in your heads. Um, also, last year we didn't get to finish our, our, our stuff on adolescent dynamics, so all of you didn't get that. And what we're going to do in essence is talk about how the human heart works and then talk about how that applies in the lives of adolescents. So you can have some categories for like understanding the things that are going on for teens, etc. like that. Lord willing, tomorrow um, I'm going to push the envelope a little more. Um, I am going to want to try to talk with you tomorrow. Um, <laughs> I've, I've tried to, to, to articulate, to write down how one-on-one -on -one works. Like, what do you say? When a kid says, I just broke up with my boyfriend and I'm so depressed I don't even want to function, what do you say next? Like, I want to try to talk to you about some principles for how counseling works. What do you do? Why do you say this? Why would you say that? And um, I've never done anything like that before, so that might just blow up in my face. But y'all will be here to see it. It'll be awesome. You know, if you're going to fail, fail big, Cox. Come on. Um, so I, don't, I thought it would be worth a try because it's what I do all the time. And I want to give you all some sort of insights to some of the way I think about that. And we're also going to apply that in... Um, in circumstances of, of um, issues, be it conflict with parents or depression or anxiety or um, bigger, more difficult issues with uh, kids, be it pornography or addictions or, you know, eating disorders, whatever. Um, that'll be tomorrow, a little more uh, nitty gritty. So today a little more theoretical. <clears throat> um, let me tell you about me just a little bit. Um, I grew up in Jackson, Mississippi and um, went to First Pres always. Like uh, one of my clients said, I had a drug problem as a child. I was drugged to Sunday school, drugged to church. Um, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, all right, yes. <laughs> I'm glad you're on the front row. <laughs> so anyway, I go to Ole Miss and I have to sort of decide, am I gonna like embrace this faith or not? And I got involved with RUF when Jimmy Turner was starting it there. Uh, and that was so fundamental to me as, as, a, as a person, as a Christian, as a professional. Because when I found psychology, I went running to Jimmy Turner to sort of say, I, I think I've fallen in love with psychology. This is what I want to do. Is that okay? It's kind of like saying, now, you know, I've fallen in love with a non-Christian girl. You know, is that all right? You know, um, and, and he really helped guide me toward, toward psychology. And one of the things that, um, I went to RTS uh, for a while just to try to get my theology down before I went off and uh, got wacko in California. Um, but the question that always plagued me is I heard counseling theories and, and people talk about how, you know, therapy worked or something like that, was that all of them seem to talk about some new information you're going to have um, that was going to make you feel better. And, and that didn't work for me. What I'm talking about is, is, is what I've always called the head-heart gap. In other words, don't you know that sense where like, you know something's true but your heart doesn't feel it? Like, I know God loves me, but I just don't feel loved. Or I know I should let go of this resentment to my spouse, but I still hold, hold on to it. Or I, I, I know that um, I'm forgiven, but I still feel guilty. And that, one of the things that plagued me as I was trying to understand and learn psychology was this thing I've come to call the head-heart gap. Like, I can tell you all day long, but don't you understand you are forgiven? Now, I don't know about y'all, but somebody tells me that, Sometimes there's still something inside of me that's like, well, I still feel guilty. You know, it like, it didn't fix me. And what I find when I talk to people in, in therapy is they'll be depressed and they will often even say, I know I don't have anything to be depressed about, but I'm still depressed. 
Okay, so how do, you, how, do you get, how do you make sense of that? That question plagued me as I went off to grad school, and I finally found the answer. Um, and, and it's key to understanding where we need to go with the whole issue of dealing with one-on-one -on -one with kids. The issue is this. If we learn something in our heads, it stays in our heads. But where do we learn the things we experience in our guts? This is key. Those experiences we have, and those things we have in our guts, those feelings we have in our guts, come from the relational experiences we have. In other words, you can learn something all day long in your head, but how you're related to is going to teach you what's in your gut. Uh, people would say to me, I don't feel forgiven. One of the questions I will ask them is, well, let me ask you, have you ever really wronged someone and known that you've hurt them? And you look them in the eye and you say to them, I really have hurt you. I get it. And you see the pain in their eyes and you see them look back at you. But then they say, but you know what? You did hurt me. But I forgive you. Like, <coughs> I'm just like you. I hurt people too. Done. Forgiven. Have you ever had that experience? And almost to the last, those people who say, I can't feel forgiven, they always say, nobody's ever done that to me. In my family growing up, man, you stepped out of line. It was, it was all over. In other words, what they experienced taught them what their gut was about. So, you can learn new stuff all day long, but if you don't have a new relational experience, you just wish whistling Dixie. So guess what? What is counseling? What is one-on-one? -on -one? A relational experience. Okay? When you start talking to somebody, the reason that one-on-one -on -one is such a vital part of your ministry, in addition to preaching or teaching or whatever, that address the cognition, that address your head, when you step into the world of one-on-one -on -one with somebody, you've stepped into a world that speaks the same language as their gut. The world of relational connection. That's why this is so important, and that's why therapy is so important, or counseling is so important, because um, the way we relate to one another is going to change things. That's why um, fellowship is one of the means of grace. That's why how we interact with each other is part of the dynamic of our growth. Um, you know, our denomination has missed that in some ways because for the last hundred years or so, we've had to focus so much on the data of our faith. Because if you look back at liberalism and neo-orthodoxy and all that, the foundation, the things that, that caused the formation of the PCA, um, we had to stand firm for the truth, the data, the theology of what was real and what was threatened. And in, in, in that, I think some our denomination has lost some of the whole focus of what is fellowship. But I think scripture presupposes this ongoing interaction among the body of Christ. That's why there's so many each others in the New Testament. You know, rebuke each other, forgive one another, confess to one another, or bear one another's burdens, or strengthen the knees that are weak, or whatever. There's this constant each other thing. And that's also why the Bible is, focuses so much on how we treat each other. Think about how much Paul talks about how we treat each other. That's not just because if you treat one another in a hurtful way, that's mean, or that's a sin, or that's bad. It's because how we relate to one another literally, actually changes us. All counseling is is a formalized form of relationship. But I'm relating to you all the time. How I relate to you up here is going to impact you. How we relate is going to touch that gut. So... Of course, big relational experience is our growing up time. That's why psychologists, counselors, whatever, often ask, you know, tell me about growing up. It's not so we can, like, find out what your mom and dad did and blame everything on them. I want to get sort of this sense of what did you learn? What were your experiences? What was your gut? And the whole issue of counseling is not some new invention, like, you know, that Freud invented 100 years ago. What we're talking about is a strategic way of approaching people in fellowship. How do I strategically, eyes wide open, walk into a relationship designed to help you heal? And God does that through relationships with people. Okay? So, I just wanted to touch on that as why I think one-on-one, -on -one, why I think counseling is such a fundamental piece to our ministries. Because it addresses that head-heart gap. And you'll have kids come see you 
kids will talk to you and they'll say, I'm feeling X, Y, Z. And you might say, but, but you, you know, you don't feel like anybody in youth group likes you. But you know everybody does. And they'll go, well, I still don't feel like they do. Okay? So I want you to recognize this whole issue of the head-heart gap. And your relationship with them, we'll talk about this tons tomorrow. Your relationship with them is the thing that can potentially change that. But... God has decided that he wants to use human relationship to make those kind of changes. For better or for worse, unfortunately. Any thoughts about that? <clears throat> Alright. Let's start looking at character. Why do people come and talk to us? If someone comes and wants a one-on-one -on -one with you, if someone comes to want therapy with me, why are they coming? Well, basically, people come to talk to us because they have a symptom. They have an owie. They have an ouchie. This hurts, doc. Okay? In other words, what they're doing is there's a, a depression or anxiety or a relationship problem or they're lonely or they hate their parents or they're cutting themselves or something like that. But basically the reason people come to see us is because of some kind of what the Bible would call fruit. Okay? Unfortunately, m most people don't come to see us or talk to us just because they want to grow in their heart. Okay, like I've only had one person in 25 years of practice who said, I just want to get in therapy because I just want to kind of grow. Like, just help me grow, doc. It actually turned out to be like one of the most disastrous things ever. Anyway, uh, anyway, <laughs> I thought at first, oh, this will be cool. No, um, it was an ant bed. Um, <laughs> Anyway, so other than that, nobody comes and says, hey, you know, just like therapy. You know, my, my parents growing up, we, every summer we're getting a family group therapy. It's great. You know, just want to kind of keep that. No, people come because they have an owie. Um, now, why do they have an owie? Why do they have a fruit? Why do they have a symptom? What's going on for them? Well, the Bible tells us this, that if you have a fruit, it's because you got a root. <laughs> if you have an external symptom, it's because you have an internal issue. Okay, God's little gift, sin, pathology, brokenness, hurt you before they kill you. Okay, it's like that smell they put in natural gas so you can know you have a gas leak. You know, uh, sin and pathology and brokenness start to create problems in your life before they ultimately destroy you. So, you know, if, you, if you're drinking too much, it ultimately starts to create fruit to where you can go, oh my gosh, maybe I need to stop doing this. Well, that's what happens a lot with our pathology or our sin. What brings people in is the fruit. The problem, the key here, the key thing here for y'all to remember is that the problem, the fruit that they come in with, ain't ever the problem. It's the fruit of the problem, all right? So, in order to fix the fruit, we've got to understand the heart. We've got to understand how we function in our hearts and in our noggins and how that works. And that's what I call character. Now, that's a, a technical word for a psychologist. I don't mean like character like... He's a man of character, like integrity. And I don't mean like you're a cut up, like ah, he's a real character. Um, character for a psychologist is a, a buzzword we use to refer to the collection of abilities that make your heart work. Okay? We throw around words like heart a lot in Christianity. One of the things w that Christian psychologists try to do is to unpack that and say, well, what does that actually mean? What does that actually look like? What are the, the mechanisms that make your heart work? And what I want to do right now is to, is to walk through those um, relatively quickly um, because some of it is, so much of this is reviewed from last year. Um, and, and give you a, a, sort of a, a refresher on what the, that character thing is about. Basically, life works like this. We walk into life and it requires something of us. We run into problems. We run into challenges. I get married. My spouse says, I want to be close. Let's be intimate. Let me really know you. Now, the question is, do I have the abilities in my character to do that? I may or may not, depending on whether I've learned them or not. Maybe I'm an eight-year-old little kid and there's a bully on the playground and he's picking on me. Do I have the ability in my character to be able to be aggressive and strong and take up for myself? If I don't, can I get it? Um, if I do have it, where did I learn it? 
In other words, people's hearts and people's characters are kind of like a car. A car has to be able to do a lot of things in order to function. It has to be able to go, and it has to be able to stop, and it has to be able to, you know, have an air conditioner in it if it's from the south. Um, and, and a car is great if it's maybe missing one of these parts until it needs it. Let's say a car doesn't have brakes. Well, you're cruising along just fine, but all of a sudden you need to stop and you don't have brakes, you just keep on going, you can see there's problems there. People are the same way. One of the things I need to have is the ability to make sense of shame, make sense of failure. So let's say I come here to speak to you, and I totally bomb, and y'all are all going to sleep, and you're hating it, and I go home and I feel so stupid. Do I have the ability in my character to not let that crush me? To say, oh, well, I didn't do so good. I did all right. I didn't do great. Can I metabolize that? Do I have that ability in my character? What we're going to talk about real briefly here, hopefully, is what are those abilities? Because I want you to have them in your noggin. I know that you remember them from last year. If I just handed out the exam, you would all pass it. I know that you all internalized it so fully from last year. Actually, when I was in Knoxville, Chris actually cited them back to me uh, almost perfectly. Um, but... I'm going to go over them anyway, all right? First ability that we need in order to make life work, I call attachment. This is that sense I have that I am loved, that I am lovable. That, I'm, that, that sense I have inside of me that you, you would like me, that I'm wantable, that it would, it, it, I'm someone who is cared about. That ability to let you know my heart, that ability to be able to go below the surface and say this is real me, that ability to know that I am accepted. How about that sense to know that I am loved? Even if you don't like me, I'm lovable anyway. That sense that I'm not rejectable. That sense that I am, um, that I could, that I matter. Um, this is where we develop that sense of being known. This is the opposite of being insecure. Attachment is I can hold on to love, and I can give love. I can let you know me. I can want to know you in an intimate sense. Does that make sense? This is where I go below the surface. This is where um, I might share with you my feelings. This is where um, you might say to me, hey, John, um, uh, what's it like for you to talk to us? Now, I could give you a, a superficial answer and go, um, oh, that's great, man. Love it. Love to do it next year. It'd be great. Let me know. Or I could give you more of my heart and I could say, it's really moving to me to be among people who want to learn the thing I've devoted my life to. That is a very that's a privilege. Now, you hear me talk like that, and you feel more attached to me, don't you? Attachment is, can I go below the surface and be known? And if I um, like upset you or something, can I still believe that you, you would care about me, or that I'm still okay? Spiritually speaking, these, say, these, these character abilities are the same as the image of God. God's version of this, he calls abiding. You know how much the Bible is about abiding. It's about love. It's about love your neighbor as yourself. It's about loving him with all of your heart. This is the core of what he wants from his people. This is the opposite of when Jesus says, you know, to some he will say, depart from me, I never knew you. In that Hebrew sense of the word know, that deep, intimate knowing, this is knowing in the Hebrew sense. Can I do closeness? Can I be connected? Now, what can go wrong here? All of us are messed up at some level in all of these. Welcome to the club. As we go along, you will see probably some way in which you're messed up in every one of these. I know I am. Um, so what can go wrong in the whole area of attachment? Um, impairment in any of these will typically send us in one of two directions. What we'll find as we go through these. Um, it, uh, one direction you can go if you're struggling with attachment is kind of become needy and dependent. In other words, I didn't get really known and connected and, and, um, and, and that intimacy thing in my life or in my family. And so I'm that person who is always needing to be reassured. I'm that person who's always feeling insecure. I'm that person who's always wondering, do you really like being with me? Do you like me? 
Do you still like me? Wait, did what I just say upset you? And you feel that insecurity from them. And what they're saying is, I'm needing reassurance about attachment all the time. I'm trying to get it. I'm not sure you really want me. Is it really okay? Okay. The other end of the spectrum, if we have struggles with attachment, is to completely reject it. In other words, just blow off the whole area of attachment. In other words, attachment, what's that touchy-feely stuff? Uh, you know, you want that kind of stuff? Go watch Oprah or something. I'm not into that. Of course, this one is often more popular with the male of the species. Right? Ma'am? Okay, good. Uh, it, this is sort of like <laughs> closeness, attachment, <laughs> that stuff's bogus. You know, that's that, that uh, you know, West Coast hot tub stuff. Eh, I don't want any of that. Um, I saw a guy not long ago, and he, as he was in his, his, his session, he kept like brimming over with tears. And they would just like come to the surface, and he'd kind of like push them back. And I finally said to him, I said, dude, you look like you need just a ball. I mean, let's... Let's go. Let's let it out, man. Let's, you know, let it go. Cry your eyeballs out. I'll be with you. Let's, let's walk into it. And he's like, I'm not going to cry in front of you. And I'm kind of like teasing him. And I said, what, was your dad John Wayne or something? And he stops and he goes, yeah. <laughs> it was a turning point in therapy. All of a sudden you realize, you know, he's not been able to feel anything. He was one of the blow-off types. Um, another thing that you'll see with this attachment thing this is kind of a third place you can often go with attachment. Oftentimes problems with attachment leads us to substitutes. And we're going to see this a lot as we start talking about doing one-on-ones and counseling. Um, like one of our favorite things to do as humans is to have a deficit in love or in faith and try to fill that emptiness with a thing. In other words, this is where you get your holics, you know, alcoholic, uh, workaholic, uh, porn addict, um, you know, affairs, whatever. We're trying to fill up that emptiness, fill up that missing attachment with a thing. About, basically, the Bible's definition of lust is um, being connected to a thing, you know, or an activity. Something that is not God or his people to try to fill us up. So, let's start thinking backwards now, now that we're building a grid. Somebody comes to you and says, you know, hey doc, I, you know, uh, can't quit shopping online. All I do is spend money online. What's the deal? What am I going to do? And you start thinking, well, let's get you like, uh, you know, some, you know, cut up your credit cards. You know, some <laughs> answer like that. Um, I want you also thinking, what is it that might be driving this? In other words, what, what kind of deficit might there be? There might be a, a deficit in terms of they need limits set on them. And with most out-of-control behaviors, we do. But I also want to be thinking, why is this person running to some sort of a substitute, some sort of an addiction? And look, start looking at the need underneath it. This person might need some sort of attachment. Maybe attachment with you. Uh, what, what, what might look like to help them grow in their relationships? You get that? Any nods? Can I hear an amen? All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dovetail sin into this later. I just want to watch our time. Um, but sin starts working into all these. We'll wait and come back to it. Yes? So I have a quick question. Good. Can someone in those first two, um, can someone swing from like one to the other? Mm -hmm. And you can do both. Um, but typically we have a, 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 a pattern. Like we have a style that we tend to go to. Um, and, and as you're talking to people, you'll start to hear that pattern. One of the things I want you to do as you're learning to work with people is to learn to listen to what they're saying in their content, but also listen to it with this grid. So it's like, um, let's go back to our person who's shopping on the internet. And they're like, you know, um, basically, uh, I had some friends try to ask me to go out to eat with them, but I'm just thinking like, that's just so stupid. They're just going to sit around and talk about the same old junk they always talk about. I don't know, just kind of hang out at home. And that's kind of where I tend to get on the internet. You go, interesting, that's a real blow-off sort of approach. Okay? Um, or they might say, um, I, I, I keep calling friends and nobody wants to do anything with me. I don't think anybody really likes me. I just feel kind of rejected and not wanted. End up just kind of being at home and surfing the web all night. 
And it's like those are two very different approaches to the same problem. Okay? But I want you to start listening with those kind of ears where we start unpacking what's going on with this person's heart. Okay? Not just what's going on with their keyboard. All right, next one is boundaries. Let's see. <laughs> if number one, attachment is about being one, about being close, about being connected, boundaries is the flip side of that, and that is to also have the ability to be separate. Can I be individuated from you? Can I be different from you? And we have to have both of these in order to make life work. You see this with children. Infants are all into attachment, bonding, connection. Two-year-olds, they start setting those boundaries. No, me. Uh-uh. Me do it. Mine. And they start having this sense of self. Right? And that's not just a bad thing. They're developing that sense of identity, which we'll come back to with teenagers because teenagers are just big, giant, grown-up two-year-olds. Okay? <laughs> They're basically saying the same thing. Instead, instead of going, no, me do it, mine, they're going, oh my gosh, that's so retarded. Okay? <laughs> um, they're saying the same thing. They're saying, I am not like you. Okay? Same as a two-year-old going, uh-uh, mine, no, me do it. They're, both of those phases of development are about individuation and separation in the, in the development of a separate identity. For the two-year-old, the development of a child out of an infant. For the teenager, the development of an adult out of a child. Okay? Got it? All right. So, there's two different kinds of boundaries. One is self-boundaries, and the other is choice boundaries. Self-boundaries are basically, can I be me? In the image of God, there is someone who is John Cox and uniquely me. I'm just different than you are. Okay? Do I know who I am? Do I know what I like? I had a client who had no sense of self, didn't know what they wanted, and we just started exploring and started asking questions like, who are you? What do you like? You do everything everybody else wants. What do you like? And they came back one day, and they said, I went to a store, and I walked in the store, and I look, and there was a shirt on the rack, and I realized, I like that shirt. <laughs> I like that shirt. You know, walking around the store going, I like this shirt. Hey, I like this shirt. You know, they were so proud of themselves because all they'd ever done their whole life is go, well, everybody wears blue jean shirts, so I guess I need a blue jean shirt. And they had never really thought, what kind of shirt do I like? Okay? Silly example, but you start thinking about spiritually speaking, and what God calls this stuff is stewardship or steadfastness. And this having a sense of self isn't that, that old man sinful self that Paul tells us to mortify. This is more like when, when Joshua brings the people in the promised land and he says to them, choose ye this day whom ye will serve. In other words, he's saying you got a choice. What are you going to do? It's for me and my house, we're going to follow Yahweh. What are you going to do? Choose ye this day. In other words, the Bible presupposes you got a ye. The Bible presupposes you know what kind of shirt you want. Now, what kind of shirt do you want? Part of our development means knowing this. And I have so many people in my office who are run around by everybody's opinions, everybody's fears, and they don't have this sense of like, I know who I am, and I'm going to be who I am. And some of you might not like it, some of you might. Either way, this is who I am in God's image. Now, part of that is fallen, and boy, that me needs to grow. But this is who I am, and this is what I choose, which brings us to the second one, choice boundaries. This is, can I say yes and can I say no? And can I hear no? In other words, am I a doormat? Am I a chameleon? Am I that person you know to call who's in your congregation who you know will be on every Sunday school committee? because they can't say no? <laughs> or do I say, no, I'm sorry, I'm on too many committees. Can I say no? Now, I have a lot of people who come see me who can't do that. And let's say they come in and they say, I'm filled with anxiety. I have anxiety all the time. I don't know what to do. And as I start talking, they start talking about how distressed they are and how pulled apart they are. Um, and I, I start thinking, can you say no? And they start, oh, no, I can't say no. I have to do what everybody wants. Well, no wonder they have anxiety. And all of a sudden, that puzzle of why does this person have anxiety all the time starts to make sense. Maybe it's because they're needy and they don't have relationships and they're, they're feeling hurt there. Maybe it's because they can't say no. I'm giving you this grid because underneath that fruit, 
of, hey, I'm anxious, I want you to start listening for the character issues of what might be missing for them in their character. Is it starting to make sense, this, this structure we're building? Um, my voice is a little strained. I'm going to try to move my mic up. Um, can y'all hear me okay? I'm going to try to take down my literal volume and maybe the mic will pick it up. Yes, sir. Just trying to understand a little bit. So the, the self and choice boundaries, are they always necessarily distinct? Because in my mind, I think no. the shirt is also a choice. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Or it's not distinguishable. Pardon me? If not the distinguishing force. That's not so good. Um, no, what I'm thinking is, um, I'm kind of the church reformed, always reforming, um, and as I hear things back from people I speak to, I'm like, yeah, you know, how do I change that? That's kind of where I went. That might be a good point. Yeah, this is more of a who am I, this is can I actually use that me and say no. Um, somewhat artificial, but both are important. Yes, sir. Could you distinguish it like uh, you emphasize and choose you this day? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good. Yeah, right. I like that. So this is also, by the way, the ability to hear no. So as that toddler or that teenager is learning to say no and have a sense of self, um, they also need to be learning to develop the sense of having room for you to have a sense of self that's not them. Can I hear no? Okay. Good. We're keeping on time. The third one is one of my personal favorites, and that is making sense of bad and good. <coughs> this is the only one of the four that we weren't intended to have to deal with. If Adam and Eve hadn't sinned in the garden, I would still be here talking to you about attachment, and I'd still be talking to you about having a sense of self and boundaries. But I wouldn't be talking to you about making sense of the fallenness of the world. And I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you about dealing with being a judge or being, feeling judged. Um, this is the only one we weren't intended to know anything about. And God actually created our hearts to where we weren't supposed to know about this. And he tried to protect us from it. And this is why this one hurts all the time. A, the world has fallen now and broken. And now we have to deal with things that feel terrible. But you, you add to that the other piece, and that is that when you eat of a tree that's called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, well, you get the knowledge of good and evil. <laughs> I don't want to push you too fast here, but... <laughs> and in the Bible, knowledge means intimate experience, like Adam knew his wife Eve. Um, and it hurts every day. Um, my wife says, y'all got all these distinctions and categories of diagnosis. Problem is just everybody's insecure. And she's right. And it's not because all of us had our mamas like, you know, abused us in the same way when we were growing up. You know, it's that all of us are born under the law. All of us are born broken in this. We don't know how to make sense of our fallenness and the fallenness of other people. It hurts us. It makes us feel shame. Shame is the feeling of what it looks like, what it feels like to encounter my fallenness, my brokenness, for it to be exposed outside the context of love. It's that, sh that, that scornful, humiliated, embarrassed feeling that is one of the most driving forces in our culture. I'll do anything to not feel ashamed, for you to not think bad of me. Think most marriage fights. We start off talking about car insurance, but pretty soon somebody blames the other one. Well, if you had gotten us a different deductible, well, really, it's all up to me then. And what do we start doing? Who's the bad one? Well, you should have done this. Well, really, well, you should have done that. And where we go all the time is this issue of shame. So the question is this. We have to have relationships in our life, possibly relationships growing up, certainly relationships within the body of Christ, that literally unshame us. Kids aren't born with this sense of freedom and spontaneity uh, and then their parents shame them into feeling bad, though that does happen. And though kids do have that sort of um, 
complete lack of shame sometimes. You know how they just like to run around the house naked. Or um, you, know, you take them out to eat and they go, look, mommy, there's a fat man. You know, they don't have any sense of, you know, so I may be disproving my own theory. But um, ultimately, we have this sense that there's something core wrong with us. And we need to literally have relationships in which people look at us and see our fallenness and say, welcome to the club. I'm as fallen as you are. Now, you're still grounded, or you're still going to time out, but the same between you and me, I love you. I'm as fallen as you. I go to time out myself. Um, you know, I was, I was speeding the other day, and mean old Mr. Policeman, you know, docked my allowance. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's the way reality works, but there's no shame. Christ took our shame. It's safe. So the question is this. Do we grow in our ability to make sense of our own fallenness? To have room to say, I'm fallen and it's safe. You know, people say, oh, it's okay to be fallen. It's okay to sin. You know, it, it's forgiven or whatever. It's not okay. You can look at the cross and see it's not okay, but it's safe now. Christ made it safe. Two reasons Christ came. One, to keep us out of hell and bring us to him, his, Himself. But the other reason is simply to make it safe for us now to talk about our fallenness. We can tell him the truth now. We can come to the hospital with our brokenness. So this is the ability, number one, to deal with shame. Can I bring you my heart and, 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 or can I fail and have somewhere encoded in me that it's okay? Can I, can I feel like I, I bombed here and, and, and be alright with it, like my example from earlier? The other piece of this one is, can I deal with the fallenness of the world? Because the world is going to hurt us all the time. There's brokenness and there's death and there's loss. And can I deal with that sorrow and not be crushed by it? Um, we need to have the relationships that teach us that love can trump shame. And that love can trump loss. One of the things we're going to talk about tomorrow is um, how to help a child, a teenager, deal with um, pain. Deal with sorrow. And one of the things we're going to talk about is... God made us in such a way that if we come alongside in a loving way with someone who is in pain, that pain metabolizes in some way I don't understand. There's something about being understood and known and cared about in the midst of pain that makes it manageable. Do we have that ability? Do we have that capacity? Okay. This one's so big and, 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 and grievous to me, as you can tell. This is an important topic. The number one problem I see in my office is shame. It reads back to shame. Thoughts about that? Yes. Shame and yeah. Shame is much more insidious. Guilt. Question was, can you distinguish shame and guilt? Guilt says, I did bad. Shame says, I am bad. Um, sh uh, it's, it, with guilt, it's easy to say to someone, I really screwed up. I made a mistake. I'm wrong. I was, I was wrong. With shame, I'd have to say, I am a mistake. I am bad, ultimately. I'm not even, I don't, I'm not, I'm not worthy. I'm, 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 I'm someone you would want to be away from. Shame starts talking about my identity and my core. Shame always feels unique. The two words that heal shame the most are me too. In other words, shame always feels like I'm the worst person in the room. Shame never says, I fail, you fail, we all fail together. That, love, connection, belonging, community destroys shame. Shame always is alone. Um, but it's more about my essence than about my deeds. Yes, sir? Is, is there um, a healthy sense of shame in the sense that I do, by nature, <clears throat> come into this world and break God's law, so having shame over that, knowing that, of course, the answer to that the cross and the gospel actually covering me in my shame. But it's not necessarily wrong to feel bad about That's such a great point. And actually it's in my notes and I forgot to tell it to you. Um, a really important distinction to make at this point is the distinction between shame, which is a technical term, and conviction of sin. The sorrow that leads to repentance. Brokenness at my fallenness. Um, Sadness at how I wound people in God. Um, I want you to feel the burden of the weight of your fallenness. It should make you grieve. If you're grieving 
That's fabulous. Shame isn't about grieving. Shame is about, I am ostracized from the human race. My core in essence is disgusting. Okay? Um, and um, so I, I encourage people to feel the fallen brokenness that leads to repentance. That's a good thing. Um, shame starts to be very self-focused and, and it actually is a distortion. It goes deep enough to almost say like, you know, me in the image of God is not worthy of existing. Okay? It has that, shame, that humiliation piece. The only place I think that there's room for shame, um, and I'm iffy on this, but I think it's possible, with kind of in your face, I don't care, unrepentant, sin sinful people who just like hurting other people and don't even care. In other words, the complete unrepentant, I'm doing it and I like it and I'll hurt you again, I don't care. I think there's some room for shame there to say, do you not understand the gravity? Of, I mean, I think there's a place for really pushing people there, but, you know. Did you say it's the opposite of pride? Did I say that shame is the opposite of pride? Um, no, I would say shame is the opposite of abiding love. Um, pride is often a um, reaction formation against shame. In other words, people say, oh, you're just worried about how you look because you, you're, that's just pride. No, they're worried about how they look because they don't want to go to the party and feel ashamed. All right? Pride is a way to make myself feel super good because shame makes me feel super bad. Okay? Yes, sir? Yes. Would you be willing to let me answer that um, if I can finish this? I want to get through the four food groups and remind me when I'm done. Um, but I'm afraid I'll run out of time and not finish. But that's a, that's a super fun question, though. All right. So the last one is making sense of authority uh, or agency. And this as part of my um, life as a growing up person is to make sense of my role as an agent in the world and at the same time make sense of the fact that I still submit. Adult life has these two components that dance back and forth. Um, and, and, and when it comes to authority, I need to be able to be over. In other words, I need to act as an authority like I am here with y'all. I'm saying, this is what I believe. I'm saying, can I wait and answer that question later? Because I know the flip side of this is I need to also submit. And I need to stop in an hour and five minutes. And I can't just decide to go longer because I have to submit. So I'm both authority here and I'm submitting. Uh, it remind you of anybody Jesus knew in the Bible? I am an authority over others. I say to this man, go do this, and he does it. Centurion. centurion. The centurion got this whole issue of the authority structure of the universe. Uh, you don't have to do anything. You can just say the word, because I'm a man who is over men, and I say to this one, go do this and that, and that slave, go do this and do that. And so, and Jesus marvels at this guy and says, he, I have not seen such faith in all of Israel. Why? Because this guy understood the authority structure of the universe. He understood that and he understood who was at the top of the food chain. Um, he understood who was the one who did not need to submit, who only submitted voluntarily out of his love uh, for us and the Father. Um, but for those of us dealing with real life, we have to have the ability to not be passive. Passivity is the, um, the unsung sin. Um, passivity is that sense of I don't step up and do what I need to do. I don't go back to my wife and say, hey, honey, we need to talk, finish talking about what we talked about last night. Uh, is when I uh, just let our, 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 our relationship with our kids deteriorate and I don't call the pastor or therapist. I don't take agency. Passivity is, this one's going to hurt, is when someone has to tell me, would you help clean up the kitchen? Instead of me initiating alone, because I have eyes and I can see the kitchen he's cleaning too. Okay, agency is I am being proactive and I'm engaging the world. 
The other one is to have the ability to submit and not feel humiliated. We'll talk about this one tomorrow with, no, we'll talk about this one in an hour when we talk about teens. One of the things we, we have to help teens learn is that you can submit and it doesn't humiliate you. One of the things that teens hate doing is submitting. Why? Because it makes them feel like they're, they're losing. And there are things we as parents and their mentors can do to help them with that. All right, so those are the fab four. Those are the four food groups. Um, if you remember from last year, they acronym out spelling ABBA, to help you remember it, as an ABBA father, or the 70s Swedish super disco group ABBA. Um, now what I want you to do with these is, um, I, I, you'll hear me addressing them in the next hour and you'll hear me addressing them tomorrow, but I want you to use these as categories for understanding when people come talk to you. I want you to use these, to use these as categories for understanding the image of God. I think that within each of these, um, we didn't say these about God, um, bad and good. How much does he talk about that one? Humility, getting the beam out of your eye, forgiveness, um, only our Father in Heaven is perfect. Um, it's constantly talking about making sense of the issues of forgiveness, humility, brokenness. Um, and this one, of course, is a, an issue of stewardship and submission again. Anyway, I want you to think about your sanctification using these categories. Um, think about your growth. You all have one of these that you have more trouble with than others. You can look in your own life or get your spouse to show you. I want you to start learning and listening to where you might be struggling and use that as part of your understanding of your growth. Um, look at your fruit and start asking where, this, where I might be getting hooked here. Um, and as you work with, with kids, um, to be able to use this as a model for understanding them. Now, I'm going to try to take on your question real quick and we'll take a break and come back. And I would appreciate y'all's silent prayers that I don't lose my voice. I can feel my voice kind of struggling. I think it's the weather or a cold I just got over. <coughs> but that would be difficult by tomorrow for me to not be able to speak. So, um, your question. What do you hear in families where there's shame? Um, uh, any... Any approach to children that implies I'm surprised at you, I'm disappointed in you, um, the way you're relating makes me feel differently towards you, evoke shame. The cure to that, the, the best solution to that, if you want to like not do that, is to know thyself. Um, in other words, I, I, I did a, a talk... Um, Oh, I remember it was, I did Vandy RUF for Stacy uh, Fall Conference this fall. And one of the kids asked this question. He said, how do you learn humility? And, and I was sort of stumped for a minute. And all of a sudden the answer came to me and I said, oh, that's easy. Tell the truth. Because if you tell the truth, you're going to be humble. <laughs> um, the only way you're not going to be humble is if you're not telling the truth. And the parents who know themselves know that they're as fallen as their kids, know that they do stuff as bad or as irresponsible or as dumb as their kids, they don't shame their kids. I used to tell mine, you know the only difference between you and me is I was born a few years before you so I know some things you don't know and God put me in authority over you like this job I have where I have to discipline you. Other than that, I'm a knucklehead just like you and I'm still learning just like you and I have gifts just like you. We're kind of a bunch of humans living here I'm older than you, you're younger than me, I'm bigger than you, you're smaller than me, but we're just people. And, you know, and, and I actually used to get them to call me out. I, I struggled with my anger with them at one point when they were little. And uh, I, would, I would like raise my voice and uh, um, I told them one day, I said, I want y'all to help me because if y'all mess up, you need discipline, you need consequences, whatever. But if I yell, that's, that's my sin, that's my problem. And I want you to like lovingly call me out on it. And so it wasn't too long after that that um, I was going off on them. And my oldest one, the one I'm going to eat supper with here in a few hours, who lives here in Nashville, um, she's like, Daddy, uh, uh, no, we did, did bad, but now you're just being mean. And I'm like, you're right, I am. Um, it like really helped my anger. Like I stopped yelling at them. Um, I brought my fallenness to them. So that's the cure to shaming your kids is is everybody's fallen. So anyway, um, so I want an hour with y'all 
uh, for our next session. And so if you take too much of a break, I'm not going to have an hour. So how quick can you go take a break and come back? Like five minutes? Thank you.